Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Corey Ross. I'm the district manager. Whoops, I just did my work bit. I'm with the Southeastern Vermont Audubon Society, and uh, we're pleased tonight to welcome Charlie Brown from the Northeast Kingdom Audubon Society to tell us about birding in the Northeast Kingdom and all the fabulous birds that you can see up there. So can you all brace yourselves? I'll, I'm happy jumping in, but let me introduce myself a little bit, if I may. Um, yeah, I, I live actually in, in Peacham, Vermont. It's a lovely place. And it's about 10 miles from St. Johnsbury where I spent 35 working, years working. I'm retired. I was uh, 30 years as the executive director of the Fairbanks Museum there. So I got to see a lot of dead birds and stuffed birds, <laughs> but it's better than nothing. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, we, we use that as an opportunity to educate a lot of people over the years. And I'm retired, and uh, so so now I'm having fun with birds and having fun with with lots of other things in nature because I also I collect wildflowers for display at the Fairbanks Museum, and uh, I also live in a place where I have to take care of the forests and uh, the hayfields and the gardens and all that stuff. So I'm kind of outdoors a lot, and so birds are always my my companions. So. Um, if Cora gives me the thumbs up, I will pull up my presentation to you uh, and, and uh, we'll see what we can get going with that. And I would say, don't hesitate to interrupt me because um, I'll just babble along if you let me. I don't, you don't like that. <laughs> Call people's attention to this amazing picture that uh, was photoed by Tom Berryman, whom you'll hear about a lot today. Uh, he was my partner in this project. And uh, this is a picture of Moose Bog, an apt name for the, its location, but also it is the, probably the most popular birding site for Northeast Kingdom birding visitors because they know this site is surrounded by uh, black spruce forest and wetlands and the bird collections here are super. So keep your eyes away, uh, ready for that when you come up to Moose Bog. Uh, but I did want to say that, that um, the Northeast Kingdom uh, seems a bit like a, a silly name for a place. It was named by uh, the governor, uh, Aiken, and uh, we accepted that. And it involves three uh, three of our counties, Caledonia, Orleans, and Essex. And that's a region with unique geological and geographical impacts about the habitats of migratory and residential birds. So I'll, I'll uh, try to get back to those issues, but, but the entire Northeast Kingdom, uh, we love it because it's a lush, natural quilt of bird habitats. You turn around and there's a whole bunch of other birds over there and then you go over here and there's a bunch over there in the woods and then there's a bunch in that in that wetland. It's amazing here. You probably have some of the same things happening there uh, in the river valley as well. But consider you get the cliffs that welcome peregrine falcons, to, and you get the peaks of local mountains for Bicknell's thrushes. You got the grasslands of bobolinks and the wetlands for the belted kingfishers. You get the singing treetop uh, songbirds, the indigo buntings, warbling vireos, and northern parulas, to the hideaway thickets down below for brown thrashers, common yellow throats, and black-billed cuckoos. So to introduce you, I just wanted you to see Moose Bog because it is a touchstone for what, what everybody thinks about when they think about birds in the kingdom. And you're gonna see a lot of photographs by Tom Berryman and he's terrific about it. So, okay, Cora, shall we move along? I don't know whether you're getting the other slides going, Corey, but I, I'm moving them on mine so I can tell, talk about things, so. Did it, did it change everybody? Yes. Okay, you got two guys in the, in the top and four birds in the bottom? Yep, yes. All right, well, Tom Berryman <laughs> is the outstanding birder and photographer on the left-hand side. He doesn't do Zoom, so he wouldn't be able to be with us. And that's me, on, that goofball on the right-hand side, that's me, naturalist <laughs> and science educator. And the four birds um, are the birders' big boreal four 
in the kingdom. They all are more common in Canada than they are in Vermont, but we've got them there. Black-backed woodpecker, a fabulous bird that, that likes to work on decaying um, spruces standing in water. Um, boreal chickadee that lives on its uh, on the insects in the in the black spruce forests. Canada jays who um, have a long uh, tradition of uh, begging for snacks from people and they do, they're fun. And then the most amazing bird there are the spruce grouse. Spruce grouse were, were um, uh, put in place in this area uh, because the habitat seems so uh, agreeable and yet there weren't spruce grouse here. So, so Fish and Wildlife installed some and they're doing really well here. That's a male and you'll see a picture of a male later on. These are beautiful birds. Then these are the grouse, not like the rough grouse that'll startle you when they go uh, These guys, you can walk right up to them, which we just did. That picture was taken when Tom and I walked up to it the other day. But the boreal forest is the big deal there. And it is the black uh, spruce forest that links uh, this area with most of Eastern uh, Canada, uh, as far as the forests go north. So um, these birds are sort of on the southern ridge, edge of a vast, vast area. And those forests uh, have some interesting uh, histories as well. We'll get back to some of that. Any questions about these birds? If not, we'll roll along. I guess we're rolling along to the next slide, Corey. Ah. People looking at, at maps now? Yes. Good, because there are two of them side by side, the same size. And you can see in the right hand uh, map, which is basically the political map, you can see the shapes of, the, of these three uh, counties even. You can even see their, uh, their county, uh, whatever you call it, uh, politically. And those cities, those towns are the centers of those, of those counties. But on the left-hand side, you see a, a, a satellite shot of the area and with the, with the uh, boundaries of these counties drawn in in yellow line, and you'll see six red X's. And those are the six sites that Tom and I talked a lot about and said, you know, we want to get people to come and see interesting birds in places with a lot of, of beautiful lands and uh, a diversity of habitats. So we've got these six places for that reason. And we'll be meeting, I'll be introducing those six habitats for you as we go along. And uh, don't hesitate to ask if you want to speak about anything there. Um, the, there are two red X's that look like they're not in the, in the counties or even in the country, but they are. I'm just sloppy with my, with my typing. So those are, those are ones that you're going meet, to meet very soon. And we're, that's the focus. And um, we have Tom Berryman and I sent to, sent to Corey two documents. One is Tom's um, Birding Essex County, Vermont. And he wrote it in, uh, six years ago. And Essex County is the one with the most a red X um, marks in it because it's got some fabulous, fabulous habitats for birds. And um, so that's a, that's a substantial document and very well documented. And it tells you how to get to those places, what to look for, what habitats to be looking for. Tom is terrific about the birds of the Northeast Kingdom. And uh, so there's that. And then um, there's a second document that was sent and I can't even remember what we called it, Corey, it doesn't really matter, but it was a description of basically the geological and geographical character of this area, as well as um, some catching up on some of the red X's as we go. So let's move on. We gave um, considerable thought to what locations would be of most interest for visiting and or learning birders. Our presentation is emphasizing those, these good six locations for the birds and why we recommend these, because you learn about how you relate with birding and what perspectives these spaces reveal that. Uh, our accompanying text will be available for, for Corey to share to you all. 
and um, also directions, maps, and descriptions of each of these Vermont wildlife management areas, which five of the six are just that, are online in the St. Johnsbury District 5 of Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department website. This is the website you need to use. And if you've got this on the screen, it's the blue blueprint with the 158 at the end. If you click on that website or get to that website in some way, you will find a list of the wildlife management areas in the Northeast Kingdom. And that's where we drew um, our sites primarily. So unique documents for, will be available for each of those sites if you go to that mm -hmm. website. Is that clear? Maybe not. So we're gonna meet the first uh, uh, site that Tom and I decided you would be interested in. And that is Wenlock Wildlife Management Area. And this is an, this is an area um, that is um, very interesting and very, uh, well, it's kind of um, dangerous because Route 105, Vermont 105, runs right through, divides Wenlock Wildlife Management Area. And it's, uh, it's cars and trucks, logging trucks, that sort of thing, bombing down Route 105 um, uh, from Island Pond uh, toward, to the, toward the, uh, uh, the Connecticut River. And it's, it's an interesting road. There's no, no place that's uninteresting for birds and wildlife and habitats. Uh, along that road, and some of it's very beautiful. But uh, when you come uh, to uh, the signs that say Wenlock, you want to look for a, a turn called South America Road. It does not go there, but it's named that. Um, you'll find a small, well, if you turn in on South America Road, you'll find a small parking area almost immediately, and that's for Moose Bog Trail, and there the Moose Bog Trail begins and takes you into the Black Spruce Forest, and eventually to a boardwalk over a bit of the bog, which is very cool because you get to see the bog right in front of you after you've been in the forest rather than, rather than have to peer between the trees anymore. And you're out there on a platform on the boardwalk and it's spectacular. We can thank the, the, the folks at Fish and Wildlife. We can also thank to, to people who donated for that, for that boardwalk and one of them was Tom Berryman. Over the years in the Wenlock area, even close to the road, uh, we've encountered Wilson's warblers, Philadelphia vireos, three-toed woodpeckers, rough-legged hawks in the winter, magnolia, black burnian, Tennessee, morning in Canada warblers, bitterns, barred owls, and a green-winged teal family, and of course, these big guys who are, have a lot of hair rather than feathers and big ears, the, the moose are dangerous when they're close to the war, to the, to the road rather. And um, if, any, if, any of, if you any, know of anybody who's collided with a moose, it is terrifying because I did, uh, not on that road, but on Interstate 91. Home, I was almost home to, to Peachum and uh, it was a misty night and uh, I was driving our, our Honda Civic up from Hanover where we happened to have a really nice dinner. And coming up on evening and uh, there's a moose crossing the road from left to right. And so I moved into the left lane. There was no other cars out there. And uh, as soon as we got close, the moose was still moving right. But as soon as we got close, the moose backed up and we took out, took out his hind quarters and it totaled the moose and totaled our car. It was no fun. So you really have to be paying attention. And if you see the mooses, Wherever you are, they are often wallowing in mud holes next to the road or coming out of the woods because they think there's a better something to eat the other side. They make all kinds of decisions to move around in there and you gotta pay attention because they are big and dangerous to your life, okay? That's Wenlock and that's true of some of these other sites but this is the best one for moose. And the birds there are fabulous. It's worth spending some time walking the roads, walking a lot of trails that Tom can tell you about in his, in his uh, essay that he wrote. And uh, if you spend some time in here, you're gonna have a fun time. Besides those, um, and, and including Moose Bog, Wenlock is the, the best site where the big boreal four are concentrated and likely to be seen. 
but there's so many others. And these are all pictures that Tom took. And I wanted you to see some of the variety. Ringneck ducks on the, on the moose bog. Cape May warbler in the forest. Canada warbler in the forest. Solitary sandpite on the shore of a, of a, of a wetland. Link, Lincoln sparrows uh, hanging out um, on shrubbery uh, near the edge of the, the bog, the moose bog. Rusty blackbirds are very difficult to come across because there's so many other grackles and red wings out there to shout them out and drive them out. But a rusty blackbird would, would find moose bog a very attractive uh, habitat. So think about it. And yellow belt, yes, was there a question, a comment? Okay. Yellow bellied flycatchers, which um, aren't in your backyard usually. Um, but they are one of the little flycatchers like, like alder and, and willow and, uh, you know, those guys, and, except this one's yellow. And it usually prefers um, a, a wetland area, but with shrubbery rather than forest. And so watch out. They have some, if, you, if you have a way to track down their call, it's quite distinctive too. And that way you'll know whether you got a yellow-bellied flycatcher nearby. Any questions on these birds? There's six, well, six of seven of them here. Oh. It's quite a mix. And um, I want to say something about the Cape May warbler um, because there are very few places where you'll see Cape May warblers um, in the summer. You see them when they're migrating north, um, but when you see them, they're a beautiful bird. Um, uh, they are headed to Canada. And the reason they're headed to Canada, Cape May warblers, uh, uh, bay-breasted warblers, and uh, Tennessee warblers were all three that decided that the best habitat they could live in were the, were the black spruce forests in Canada because there was the spruce budworm uh, blight there. Mm. Spruce bud, budworm uh, these were little critters that were destroying those trees. And these, these birds found them very, very tasty. Not the trees, the bugs. So, so um, the, I think that the spruce budworm is, has cleared up uh, in most of that area. <coughs> I don't know that it has shown up in, in the Northeast Kingdom, but uh, those birds were definitely headed for that. Any questions any, about these? Um, the Canada warbler is, uh, is, that's a kind of a scrappy picture or, no, it's not a scrappy picture, it's a scrappy picture of that, uh, a scrappy bird. Um, the Canada warbler usually has a nice black speckled uh, uh, band across the, the neck and chest and it's very handsome and uh, have a nice song too. Okay, let's see, any questions there? If not, we okay, Corey? Lost him. <laughs> Sorry, I gave you a thumbs up, but you can't see me. We're good. I can't see you. I can see a bunch <laughs> of birds because I'm looking at my screen. <laughs> and I, I hope people are seeing the same screen. Are you seeing that screen, Corey? Yeah, we were. We just switched to the next one. Okay. Oh, well, yes. Silly video. Oh, Conte, the National Fish and Wildlife Refuge. Now that reaches all the way down to uh, down to Massachusetts, south of you, and uh, but the refuge has a very, very special part of the Northeast Kingdom, and that's the Nulhegan Basin, and it's huge, and that was the acquisition by the feds at a time when uh, vast uh, forest land was being redistributed in new ways, and uh, when, 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 well, all different kinds of, of Part, parcels are there now. Lots of wildlife management areas that were part of that forest that were separ separated out. But this is federal. And uh, they have a headquarters on Route 105. It's a very, very attractive red building. Um, and it's about two miles uh, north of or e west of this sign, because this sign is about where the Nulhegan River flows right underneath 105 and uh, a side road, Stone Dam Road entrance is right here. You can see it there. Great road if you have a decent four wheel drive vehicle um, for quite a ways and take a map, map with you because there's a network of those roads in here. Every one of them has something more interesting to see and to share with you. 
but uh, don't go out there if you don't think your car can handle it and it's not open in the winter or in mud season. So you can walk it, you can sn snowshoe it uh, whenever you want, but, uh, but it's a beautiful area and it's a great place to explore. There are all sorts of, of fly catchers, vireos, warblers, and a variety of other songbirds, as well as birds that stand in the, in, uh, on the edges of the rivers and on, you know, on the sand banks and, and mud banks, and those would be shorebirds that some of them may just be here and some of them may actually be headed north because most of our shore, shorebirds don't stop in Vermont, they keep going. So any questions about that? The refuge is a fun place to see. They have a lot of information if you pull in to see it. And actually that has its own, um, its own website too that you can check and they have a map in that that's, that's very, very effective. So try it. Okay, the Nulhegan Basin Division of the Silvio O. Conte National Fish and Wildlife Refuge. This is, um, this, oh my gosh. Tom has taken so many different and unusual uh, bird pictures in this area. Like, um, you know when you're gonna see Northern Shrikes and that's usually in mid to late winter. You're not gonna see black-throated blue warblers then. You're gonna see them probably in May uh, in the forests up here. You see a female spruce grouse. She's as busy as the males, but she's beautiful. Uh, and the, both waxwings are here um, by uh, mid, fall, I'm sorry, by mid-spring, but the cedar wax wings are here year-round and bohemians show up in late winter uh, from all the way over from western Canada. And so that's a lot of work to get to a place as wonderful as uh, the, north, <laughs> the northeast. Uh, so, <clears throat> and we also have snipes in there, both along the rivers in the wetland as well as in the air. And then you got these last two. Um, they, I think I think something is maybe blocking the name of those ducks. Anybody know what those are? Those are Barrow's golden eyes, and you almost never see them uh, in southern Vermont. They're, they are likely to show up most um, in this stretch of of, uh, of Vermont. But even then, they're quite rare here. We see common golden eyes sometimes, but barrows are amazing. And you can tell them that they're not uh, common because, well, the males, the, the white spot on the face is very different and the, the, the head is shaped with like, as if it has a crest. But they're beautiful ducks and to see two of them together, a couple is really wonderful. Tom was very lucky. And above them on this screen is one of the most ferocious birds you'll see anywhere in Vermont. And that's the Northern goshawk. And uh, does anybody know any stories about goshawks? Um, if not, I, I know one. There was, a, there was a, a biologist who spotted a Northern goshawk nest in central Massachusetts uh, in, a, in a hardwood uh, forest. And, he decided he wanted to uh, go up to the tree right next to the goshawk's nest tree so he could photograph it. And the, the male goshawk came bombing in toward his nest and with his talons out, raked the guy's scalp and the guy dropped out of the tree and almost died. So you don't, don't want to mess, mess with these I, hawks. I, I got attacked. You're mute. I got attacked by a pair on the, on the Metacoma Trail in Connecticut. Oh, did you? Wow. And what I did was, as, as a climber, having read a lot of old stories of the old climbers in the Alps who, when there was rock fall, would hold their packs over their heads. Oh. That's, why, that's why I still have my scalp. <laughs> well, well done then. <laughs> We're all glad for you. Yep. But um, yeah, and uh, actually the, the, uh, the raptor that, that attacks us um, about four miles from where I live, right on Route 5 in Barnet, there's a there's a road cut there that is uh, there's a so there's like a, a rock cliff and with 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 yes <laughs> yes peregrine falcons there and if you bike by there or walk by there or just mosey around there on the road they may come after you right at your head and whew, that's scary I, I hope bicyclists know that because there are a lot of cyclists up there these days now anyway. The goshawks may be the, the most aggressive, but the peregrine falcons are, are no slouches either. 
I, I happened to see a, a, a juvenile goshawk in Brattleboro last fall, and it was absolutely beautiful. Yeah. And the coloring is so different. I, it took me a while. I didn't have a book or binoculars, but it, it was moving very slowly along the road as I followed it. And I was finally able to get enough of its landmarks to figure it out because I had no idea what I was looking at. Yes, I agree with you on that because uh, when I was uh, just just a young uh, person at the Fairbanks <laughs> Museum, they actually had cages to house uh, injured animals and birds. And so uh, we sort of did a, a, a little bit of VINs work up our way and we did have a young goshawk there for a few months. And oh, you're absolutely right, brown all over. It still had the eye stripe though. <laughs> yeah. Right. I think what I what got it for me was a little bit of a stripe at the base of its tail. Oh yeah, yeah, right. Because so, I, I, it never turned around to face me, so I took some sleuthing. But uh -huh. anyway, it was beautiful. But that's true of so many birds that the, you know that the mature ones after their after their molts uh, several times they they change their clothes, and uh, it's true for most of these birds. Anybody see northern shrikes down your ways? They're found most winters somewhere in yeah. the county. They are, yeah, because they, they, we see them about, uh, we, you know, just driving along the roads, we see a couple of them, uh, not together, but one or two uh, if we go for enough uh, out for a day. But, uh, but yeah, you got to know what you're looking at and where, the, where to look for them. Because that picture in this that, that Tom got of the shrike here, just amazing, sitting on the tip of a, of a thin, uh, probably a small um, young tree and waiting for food, which would be small mammals and small birds. And so they are very vicious, the northern shrikes. But very, they're a northern bird. They prefer the edge of the, the, of the forest lands. Um, right up through Quebec okay, and Ontario to even further northern, northern than that before the forests are done. And that's where the shrikes like to be, but they're in Vermont in the winter. And we kind of like that. Let's see what else we've got. Oh yes, the Victory Basin. Now, this is such a fabulous place. Um, the picture on the left shows you the sign that, uh, that one of the signs that you, you will see if you're there. But this one is important to look at this sign because right behind it is a relatively large parking area and the sign is right on the road. The Moose River is across the road. There's a very large wetland on this side of the road. So there's a lot to see um, and a lot to walk on and enjoy uh, here right by the, just by being on the road and a couple of the trails because you don't want to wander off and go right into the water. But it's a very wet basin. Um, but Victory Basin and its landscape, its history, and its wildlife uh, are covered very thoroughly in Tom Berryman's uh, coverage about Essex County. This is this this and the Nelhegan are two huge basins uh, scoured out by glaciers long ago, and uh, they're both both places that sprouted uh, some some black spruce and the big boreal four birds. Uh, are in both places. Victory Basin has miles of trails, a lot of mammals in it. It's got raptors by all, everywhere you turn around almost, or, and fabulous varieties of warblers. So all you gotta do is walk along the level uh, gravel road uh, along next to the Moose River and look at the map that you have, that you get, uh, and take a look at it and figure out where the other trails, because there are a couple of other really good trails to explore, but the main road is gravel. And so the, the traffic isn't gonna blow you down, but stay on the edge of it. And uh, you'll be able to see and enjoy a lot of birds along the way. And Victory Basin was one of the first places that I really threw myself into as a, as a natural area um, in the Northeast Kingdom because it's got so much there. And these two guys, well, obviously the snowy owl is likely to be there in the winter and the barred owl likely to be there all year round. And uh, you can't, you almost can't get through there without hearing barred owls and you're lucky to see the snowy owls there. 
but there's a lot of other animals there and a lot of other birds there. And if you get some good walking shoes, you can have a good time. There is a trail right out of that parking lot, but what it, what it does is it goes, goes through a little patch of, of woods um, that would, would entertain um, alder flycatchers and willows, willow flycatchers, that sort of habitat. But once you cross that, there's an old, old railroad bed. It's, it's, there's no tracks on it anymore. It's an old railroad bed that was the result of a, a forest a harvesting, a wood far harvesting uh, railroad built to bring in logs to turn into lumber. And it went on for a couple of decades, I think, right through there. And uh, that was not uncommon in the Northeast Kingdom because trains proved to be, and railroads proved to be probably the most efficient way to get wood out of these places. And a lot of wood has left the Northeast Kingdom over the years. And so the habitats are, <clears throat> I would say, not all the same all the time. And that's worth paying attention about. Uh, because there is a lot of logging going on there. In some of these uh, wildlife management areas, and including the Nulhig, Nulhegan Basin, um, they clear land for things like um, uh, woodcocks. And uh, that, that's ad adding a habitat that wouldn't have been there otherwise. Okay, next victory. Next one is is the red X that was way up in the in the corner of the state the Johnson Farm Wildlife Management Area. And this is, this is a wonderful place. Um, and it's a, it's a beautiful drive on Vermont 102, which goes up from, from uh, I guess, Guildhall all the way up to Canaan, and then you're, you're at the end of it because Canada's in the way. Um, take that drive, the upper end of it will pass through miles and miles of farmland. In fact, Vermont 102 is, is one boundary of that farmland and on the other, the other boundary is the Connecticut River. So all this floodplain uh, farmland is being put to work and hundreds of acres in there uh, in the F Johnson farm, um, hundreds of acres are part, that farmland is a working wildlife management area, which is kind of cool. Um, and the Connecticut River Valley is on the other side, as I mentioned, but but you don't see a lot of of wildlife management areas that are dominated with with uh, farming or forestry. But here, this farming, and I want to tell you something about the name, the Johnson Farm. Uh, the Johnson Farm uh, extends several miles between the the river and the road. And um, the owner of it had been, and still is a par partial owner, is Bill Johnson. And we, we stopped and talked to Bill Johnson last week and he's one of the most pleasant people you could, you could talk to. Bill Johnson owned hundreds and hundreds of farmland in that valley. And he also worked as a legislator in Vermont, in Montpelier. <laughs> Amazingly neat guy. Um, and he wanted, he was tired of, of farming that much land. So he turned over a good batch of it to the, to the state to do what with it they wanted to that would support wildlife. And that was a good idea for him. And it, it'll work out well for him. On this, uh, it's important to know that <clears throat> uh, they, up there, um, as well as lots of other places along the Connecticut River, Farmlands and floodplains, backwaters, oxbows, and shores of the river all offer habitats for different kinds of birds. Tom and I walked in there uh, um, next to Bill uh, Johnson's uh, barn the other day and saw birds in amazing places. There's an oxbow there and I'll, I'll change the picture and you can see where I'm talking. This is what it looks like when you're just driving by. That's not the main road, that's not the highway. That's a, the farm road that takes you from the highway all the way down through the valley to get to the river. But before you get there, maybe you can see a little bit of it down behind the barn, some, some bushes and trees um, to, the, to the right of the farm road, there is an oxbow there. And all of these places with water tend to have 
a lot of the same plants. Uh, you know, they have shrubs that attract the flycatchers. They have a lot of ferns going on, and there's specific tree species that uh, that are attracted to certain birds, like uh, great crest, uh, crested flycatchers and Baltimore Orioles. They love them. So uh, we went in, walked into that, and you had to get away through that stuff to get to the edge of the oxbow. But when we did. We did see shorebirds and uh, wood ducks, and uh, it's a great spot. And you got to the if you got to the river, you'd see mergansers, and uh, it's a great place to be looking also for raptors, particularly those uh, you know harriers. Um, so if you go up Route uh, 102, headed north, and you see a sign that says <coughs> Johnson Farm Wildlife Management Area. Look for this uh, this red barn on the right hand side on the riverside, and it's a good place to go wandering and uh, see these habitats in a in a comfortable way. Except when you get to wade through the ferns and stuff to get to an oxbow or to the to the bank of the river, but it's a very lovely place. Site number five. Remember, there are six. Site number five is a five is a little different because it's South Bay Wildlife Management Area. And uh, South Bay is the southern bay of Lake Memphremagog, and Barton River flows into the South Bay uh, almost directly north, north, from south to north. And so, so this, is a, this is a combination that is easy to travel along. And um, you go from one tan town to another, Orleans, Vermont, to Newport, Vermont. And Newport's on the on the on the corner of uh, Lake Memphremagog, Orleans is really where you can start to see the, the Barton River expanding, and that river flows through all kinds of of wetlands. Some of which are are you could swim in them. Some of them are uh, trickles through through valleys. Uh, some of them are running through forests. Some of them are in farmlands, and they're it's just a beautiful valley. And the Barton River is slow to to move and you will be too because the road that is parallel to it there is the, the river road and it's a gravel road that probably holds you to about 10 miles per hour. They, um, so this is a wonderful place because the shorebirds uh, follow this valley because it seems to be a flyway for them uh, because a lot of the shorebirds head north. And in the marshes that, that uh, for, are formed around the, the, this Barton River and on the edges of the South Bay, Bitterns are there, you can hear. Virginia rails are there, soras are there. And a couple of late springs uh, years ago, we had common gallinules there. The sad thing about this area is that because there's a lot of development happening close by, um, two species that were very interesting have abandoned this area in the past 20 years. Black terns were common in South Bay, no longer at all. And get this one, this is really a surprise. Upland sandpipers, we would see them on the grasslands and farms um, uh, uh, that over, looks over South Bay, including the uh, airport there that is all, say, all grass. So the upland sandpipers seem to be awfully happy and then they didn't show up again. But you get down close to the water and you've got marsh wrens and pie-billed grebes and wood ducks. They're all present all summer, as are many passerines, such as red starts, kingbirds, warbling vireo, Baltimore oriole, yellow warblers, particularly like those kinds of settings, and a few others you can imagine, like the yellow throats and uh, uh, red-winged blackbirds and quite a few others. So something to think about when, when, if you take the road, the river road, there are instructions in the documents that we're sending to you. There are uh, driving instructions and walking instructions for where, where, how to get from point A to point B. I can't tell you and have you remember it while sitting here looking at a screen, but river road does take you to where it stops. It, it, it comes to a, for a T and where it stops right there at that T uh, just to the left, there's a stand of very large um, uh, white pines looking down over the uh, Barton River Valley. And in those pines, there are many pine warblers, which you don't see in very many places up here. And uh, if you go the other way, 
you can ha hook on to some nice grasslands and then dip down on to a on, onto a road that runs on the eastern shore of South Bay. And I'll tell you more about that. Uh, and you could, what, the best thing to do is just to read it, but I'll tell you because I've got a couple of pictures about it. So here's a view of the variety of South Bay habitats. If you look closely, you've got cattail marsh right in front. You got shallow channels, you get the wooded delta. I got to mention this. See the, the first group of trees there. Barton River and its partner, the Black River, both built up deltas in the South Bay of Lake Memphremago because so much sediment were, was carried in there and there's no place for it to go. It really built these deltas. And now that delta has a very narrow uh, Barton River with, with trees and other things going on on both sides of it and comes out, you can see where it comes out at the very right end of that line of trees. The wide lake of South um, Bay is visible over way over on the right high side of this screen. And the distance west shore you note, notice is forested. And that's interesting because that's the most likely place in this part of Lake Memphremega where you would see bald eagles. And then there's the horizon. The horizon reveals way back behind that sand, stand of trees, reveals Vermont's largest waste management landfill, by far larger than any one other in Vermont. And it may, we fear that it may slowly leach into the South Bay of Lake Memphremagog, and the Canadians are really ripping it about that. So you might want to find some additional text for South Bay access. access. It's, a, it's a really lovely place. All right, uh, the, thing, well, the thing, this is number six now. This is my favorite, Eagle Point Wildlife Management Area. Eagle Point is also right up against, tucked up against the Canadian border, and it's snuggled into uh, a point uh, of, in, of land at Lake Menfermagog. And it's there for a reason that's a wonderful story, but um, uh, before I get to that, I want you to think about this beautiful site. It's mostly grassland, slightly rising above the lake, wake, the, the lakes, uh, level, as indicated by the dozens, dozens of breeding bobolinks. I saw I, two weeks ago, I was out there and I counted 40 bobolinks pairs in this one grassland. And, and the area also has uh, a creek that comes right out or flows right into the lake. And that creek uh, drains through the wildlife management area, surrounded by marshy habitats. There's a viewing platform, that gives birders chances to see all sorts of things. Canada geeses, Canada geese rather, <laughs> whoopee, ring neck ducks and other waterfowl, but also great blue and green herons, American bitterns, ospreys, northern harriers, woodcocks, savannah sparrows, and even bald eagles as well. And uh, <clears throat> it's quite a wonderful piece of land and this is what it is. Uh, I took both these pictures from sort of the high end of the land. The left-hand picture shows the, um, the, uh, the creek that's running through there. And uh, that's as wide as it gets, but there's open water there and the ducks and geese love it. And so do the wading birds. And on the right, that, that view is looking eastward. On the right is looking at uh, the lower end of Lake Memphremagog. Um, and that is looking almost due south. And uh, the, the site does not have a lot of frontage with the lake with, that you can enjoy, but you can walk up to it in tall grass and take some pictures and see if there's anybody on the shore. I can tell you that the trees that line the shore there uh, have lots and lots of birds in them. Great crested flycatchers and all sorts of other things. Um, yeah, vireos and, and uh, um, and flycatchers, other flycatchers, and orioles, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And so this has wonderful habitats in the grass, it has habitats in the water, has, or near the water, and it has habitats in what you would think stand, standard forest. Uh, but these rows of trees uh, are not quite the same as a forest, are they? Anyway, the story of this land is Vermont Fish and Wildlife has 420 acres in just this property. 
and it is absolutely spectacular and beautiful. And um, those both those pictures were taken from a trail that I walked around. There's a trail that circles most of the grassland, and um, that trail also parallels the international border within a few feet, not yards, not miles, a few <laughs> feet, and you're right on it. And and they they will know it if you cross that though. There's a parking space uh, where the former the former farmhouse was. There's a parking space where you often see the border control there, just sitting there watching people what they're doing. They get your license, you know, stuff like that. But but it's you don't need to cross because you're in a wonderful place. Uh, but we got 420 acres from a from a. a very wealthy man from Montreal. His name <clears throat> um, was Michael Dunn. And Michael Dunn was an art collector, so he was doing pretty well. And he was also a property collector because he had enough to give us 420 acres right there. He actually wanted to give it to the United States, which he did, but the state took over its management. Just up on the other side of the border, there are 420 acres of Canada, of Quebec, that he gave to them because it was all one property. And uh, he had the most amazing home property here. And this was only his vacation place when he's not in Montreal, but oh my gosh, I love it. And <clears throat> there are, this is one of my favorite places for another reason, that is Savannah Sparrows. Those little Savannah Sparrows singing their high buzz uh, in these grasslands. Just, you never know whether you're gonna see them or not. And one last thing about this place, <clears throat> I don't go chasing uh, rare birds. I don't, I don't, you know, because if you try to, you're gonna wind up with a crowd. Um, but I was out here um, last year on a day that was sunny like these pictures. And I was walking up the dirt road that, that goes right through this property. And I heard, a, I heard a, a, a buzzy voice of a bird. I said, you know, that's not a Savannah Sparrow. And I think it's a grasshopper sparrow. And about five minutes later, the grasshopper sparrow showed up right on the edge of the road where I had a good look at it. I had never seen one before. That's the kind of a thrill that you can have in place in these places, each one of these places we've talked about. Okay, so Michael Dunn, we're very grateful to, and uh, that he died in 2007. So these properties have been in, in government ownership since then when his will was cleaned. Okay, any questions about Eagle Point? It, there, in, your, in the materials we sent you, there are clear directions about how to get there. And uh, it's not unpleasant. Um, <clears throat> there's one place you can stop and get a spectacular view of the, of the southern end of the Lake Memphremega. I say the southern end because 20% of the lake is in the United States and 80% is in Canada. And uh, so the huge water, water <laughs> value, uh, valley, valley of this lake is also another huge basin. And uh, it drains ultimately to the St. Lawrence River. Okay, here are a few extra sites. I don't know whether you're seeing this screen, but there were some extra sites that we were interested in, but we couldn't add to the list. Groton State Forest, which is in the Southwest corner of the kingdom, um, it's a beautiful place. It's got some nice mountains. It's got some nice forest trails. And there's a wonderful three mile woodland trail around Kettle Pond. And uh, it, the trail is rocky. The pond is just nothing but holding a, a water and rock. And if, you, if you're going traveling there, you'll be, have to pass, pass Kettle Pond on Vermont 232 that goes through the, through the forest. And you'll see a sign and there's some parking for Kettle Pond. <coughs> So take the three eight mile walk. It's, it's very nice. And there are a couple of things about it. First of all, if, you, if you're lucky, you'll see both species of mergansers right on the water swimming around, the, the hooded and the commons. And you will also, if you're on the trail, you'll also probably come, up, come across <laughs> some wild rhododendron. The, probably the farthest north, north rhododendron that's wild, not planted, um, probably the farthest north in any place in the United States. Uh, it's a wonderful state forest. Um, 
Also, another site that we talked about is uh, Lake Will Willoughby, which is beautiful. It, it sits in a deep U-shaped value car uh, valley carved out by the glaciers. It's the deepest lake in Vermont. It's the most photogenic lake in Vermont. And on both sides, you have high faces of rock cliffs. People would climb those. I just think they're going to drop dead. And there were uh, some of the earliest... Uh, um, uh, peregrine falcons coming back to Vermont were on those cliffs. But anyway, Mount Pisgah Trail is, takes you over Mount Pisgah on the east side of Willoughby Lake. This trail's south end uh, on Route 5A is about half a mile south of the lake. It's got some parking and an area information. Um, so climb out of your car and walk into the woods on that trail. Starting out and at about 100 yards on the trail, you'll be on boardwalks over marsh and small pond. Birds, to, this is not even headed, starting to go up the mountain yet, but birds to hear there are blue-headed vireo, marsh wrens, alder flycatchers, wood thrushes, vireos, warbling vireos, white-breasted nuthatch, swamp sparrows, common wet yellow throats, scarlet tanagers, and American red starts. They're very common in there. So hike up the trail from there and expect swans, swainsons, thrushes, ruby crowned, crowned kinglets, and as when you reach the top, reach the top, maybe you'll see some black poles. Mount Pisgah is a wonderful trail, and the views down on the on the lake are just spectacular. Oh, but you have to hold on and be careful. <laughs> um, another another site that is of, of interest is the the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail which you could travel on foot or bike from South Main Street in St. Johnsbury all the way to Channel Drive in West Danville. I think it's about 11 or 12 miles. There's, there's more to be built onto that rail trail all the way across the state, but this is the part that's been developed. And if you walk that, you'll see warblers, vireos, kinglets, sparrows, swallows, grosbeaks, and thrushes. And because you pass by or get to the, the north end of Joe's Pond, there's a marsh there, and boy, does that expand things. The most exciting thing you might see at Joe's Pond is if you're there in early September or on a cold, wet day in the summer, because that's when the swallows all have to take cover. And I've seen uh, in that marsh several hundred um, tree swallows just waiting for the weather to change. It's amazing to see the swallow. They, you see that, that, you see that um, when they're headed out of, to head out of the ocean too, they just will wait until the huge flocks of swallows are confident about the weather. And one more, and I'm not going to bother this, you with much with this because Tom wrote a lot about it. And this is in the east end of Concord, Vermont, uh, uh, which is on Route 2. It, there's an undeveloped rail trail there too. This, this one's undeveloped though. It's become a footpath eastward from uh, the end of Miles Pond where they have a public beach. So you, if you read Tom's uh, article carefully, you can take that trail without getting lost or, or uncomfortable, but see it and, and read it. And the birds in there are very, very thick. It's kind of fun. Okay. Any questions? There's, there are many other spite spots. As, as I said early on, that the Northeast Kingdom is like a quilt or a, quilt or a patchwork of great uh, habitats for birds. You can't turn mm -hmm. around. And... It's great that way. So just a few more of Tom Berryman's Northeast Kingdom bird photographs. This is the quiz page. Mm -hmm. So uh, lower left is what? It's a brown creeper. It is a brown creeper, yeah, and a charming little bird. The bird to the right of the brown creeper is a... White-winged crossbell? Yes, right on. Well done. And next to him is... It's a warbler. Parallel. Parallel, that's right. And uh, how you get a picture of a parallel warbler uh, while, while standing on the ground. You'd have to, they are almost always in the high places of the trees. And next to the parallel is one of Tom's funniest photographs. And you probably would be able to identify the bird, but you'd have to laugh about it because that is. Oh, 
Yellow, yellow warbler. Yellow warbler. That's right. Okay. The two pictures above. Wh who's that pink bird? Oh. Uh, no looking in your books allowed. <laughs> the pink bird is, is a bird you're most likely to see in the winter, Pine especially bird. up here. And there were huge flocks of them this winter. That's the pine grosbeak. They don't spend a lot of time in the pines. They eat uh, they eat seeds and fruits, mostly very small fruits, um, uh, when they mass up, kind of like Bohemian waxwings. But they are beautiful, and they have a lovely voice. And they're they're not they're not timid. They're very very easy to approach. So Tom was lucky to get some really bright pictures of the pine grosbeaks. And finally, that that ferocious looking bird in the top of the picture. Who's Cooper. that? Coopers. Ah, close. <laughs> oh. Yeah, you got three choices on that, don't you? It's not a goshawk and it's not a cooper, so it's a sharp shin. Oh. And, and oh. It is. And you know, it's easy to say yeah, cause Coopers because of the rounded there. tail, but you really that really only matters when uh, the tail is in flight. If it's, if it's rounded, it's probably a Cooper's. If it's squared off, it's probably a sharp shin. The other thing that is a field mark for okay. Cooper's and sharp shins is the neck. Yeah. Um, if the bird in flight shows um, a neck, not, not the skin, but the shape of a neck connecting the head to the body, to the torso. And uh, if you see that, it's almost certainly a Cooper. And uh, if you don't see much of anything that looks like a neck, um, it's the sharp shin hawk. And uh, these guys are in my yard about three times a week. And I love seeing them. They're so wonderful. Okay, so Tom, would you agree with me that Tom is a good photographer? Oh, yes. Okay, I'll make sure I tell him. Because mm -hmm. he took all these pictures. All of them. He, he likes the funny ones. He had a few other funny ones I didn't show you, but he's got these fabulous pictures and some of them are the most poised birds. <laughs> uh, anyway, so now I want to thank you for your interest in the birds here in the Northeast Kingdom. I hope we'll see you sometime when you're up here and I hope you'll take a look at these, at least these six places and some of the others. And if you want to post any questions, please read the text that accompanied the slideshow before. I mean, I by post, I mean by email. Then you may reach out to me and there's my email. If you, you can send me any, just tell me that you, oh, I saw you when we were talking about the Northeast Kingdom birds. That would be my clue that you're here with us, with us this evening. If that's the case, uh, I'd be happy to, to answer, try to answer your questions. And watching birds is not something that uh, I lock down on very much because I like to think about what the birds are seeing themselves. And there's the answer. I, <laughs> I mentioned I didn't chase, uh, chase rare birds. Many years ago, there was a Ross gull um, in, down in Massachusetts. And a friend of mine, I said, we gotta go see that. You know, this gull is pink and it's from way up in the Arctic. I said, okay. So we showed up and there were about 500 people there <laughs> and, uh, and probably about 2000 gulls. And we picked out the pink one, but that was it. But everybody's hooping and hollering and you didn't get a good clear look. This is a better way to do it if the birds are in the trees instead of on the water. <laughs> but anyway, have fun if you go out as a group too. Now, um, I did want to recommend, make some recommendations before I sign off. Um, the information that Fish and Wildlife has for each of its wildlife management areas, you really need to check in. And there's another ver copy of the, of the website that'll get you to where you can check the names of those, uh, those wildlife management areas. And you can click on them if you have a computer. You can click on them and you'll get the, a two-page response. One side is text, the other side is map. And Tom Berryman's essay, which runs about 16 pages on birding Essex County, Vermont, uh, that is absolutely rich in, you, you, could, you could walk right in there and say, well, Tom told me to go here and go here and go here. And he will tell you where to find a, a black back woodpecker and he'll, you'll be, he'll be right from, from, his, from his, and he wrote this six years ago. <laughs> and uh, you are welcome to this set of slides that echo some of the information that feature Tom's photographs. But I would ask, 
that um, if you get a copy of the slides, and uh, and Corey knows this, and and that is please don't please don't use Tom's photograph. Just in, enjoy them. That's what we're doing here tonight. And I'm using them because I asked him, and he's one of a good friend. He said, "Yeah, you take what you want." And uh, uh, so I had to put them on my computer, and that's not really clear for for uh, good practice otherwise. And the still relevant book, Bird Watching in Vermont by Ted Muren and Brian Pfeiffer remains very useful. I was checking through it the other day, I said, wow, they really had it covered. <clears throat> it was, it's, it's old, but it's really good. And so those are some really good sources and I hope you'll enjoy them. And uh, if you are gonna wind up coming to the Northeast Kingdom and you have a question about where to go, don't hesitate to to give me an email and I'll, keep, I'll try to hook up with you, okay? Thank you all for your love of birds and your patience with this presentation, really. We hope you'll enjoy birding in the Northeast Kingdom soon. Char uh, this is Charlie, you'll meet Tom and he would be thrilled. You would be thrilled to meet Tom. Walking through the woods with him is something, a real treat. So try to arrange that. I can't give you his email, but um, if you call, if you reach me out, I'll ask, I can forward your, your reach to, to him, okay? Lovely talking with you all and uh, hearing you all. And I hope you all saw the same thing that I did because I looked at my entire slide program and I hope <laughs> you did too. What do you think, Corey? Did we get through it? I think we were in good shape. Good, all right. <laughs> well, I hope you all had a decent evening and I wish you good luck with the upcoming events you all got lined, uh, lined up. So... Our, our, our Northeast Kingdom Audubon chapter is far less um, active the way you are because we have one project that we do and it's costs, I know this because I'm the, the chapter's treasurer, it costs us about five to $8,000 each year, which we go out and fundraise for, for something that I don't know as any other of the chapters does, does this. We send children uh, from ages of eight to 11 to maybe even 12 to um, a wonderful place over in uh, near Bar Harbor. It's called Acadia Institute of, of, for Oceanography and they run a camp for kids. And we send those kids to that camp and the kids have to apply for, for it. And uh, we tell them, and the parents have to pay a small portion of it. But at this stage, uh, we've sent well over 50 children to the coast of, coast of Maine. And why? Because most of them have never even seen the ocean. And, and of course, habitats on the co coast are very different. And they, were, they come home thrilled. They do these presentations to us. And they talk about going on a lobster boat. They also talk about going shopping <laughs> in Bar Harbor. <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's the key thing that our chapter does. But we do do... Um, uh, some programs in the field, and uh, uh, we we have managed a, a, <clears throat> a Christmas bird count for 25 years. Um, we have um, a couple of other things that we do with with regularity, and uh, sometimes we do a walk in the spring that is right at the migration moment. And if we catch it right, we take people wow. out. Their jaws jaws just drop at all they're seeing. So, captured his email for getting him on our email list. Charlie, there was a question in the chat. Um, okay. Paul Muller wanted to know, when you and Tom go birding, uh, yeah. does Tom use binoculars until he sees something that he wants to photograph? And what type of equipment does he use? Oh my gosh, I wish he'd tell you, I could tell you, the, I could tell you, I think, he, I think he's got a Swarovski telescope. It's a beautiful piece of, of vision. And I don't know what his camera is, but he does, it's the, the, he couples them up and uh, he can sit in his living room and take pictures of birds in the trees outside and get beautiful, beautiful pictures. But he doesn't do that very often. Everywhere he goes, he lugs that equipment and you, you could forward that, I can forward that email to, to Tom and he could explain specifically what, what tools are in his, in his deal. Because when I go birding with him, I take my binoculars and that's it. <laughs> Every once in a while, if, if we do a group and say we've got 20 people, he'll say, oh, I can see a purple gallon. No, he can, I can see a common gallon right across there. And if he has something like that, everybody's got to see it. And he lets them. It's really sweet that way. And uh, he hasn't, we haven't broken a thing yet. <laughs> haven't knocked anything in the water either. So um, I'll try. I, why don't I ask Tom to send um, uh, his, his uh, equipments 
uh, a list of his, his photographing and bird watching um, uh, equipment and have, have him send that to you, Corey. Would that work? Yeah, I think that'd be great. People would really, I think, be happy to hear to see that. Yeah, yeah. The picture we I put in the in our in our uh, slides this morning, uh, this afternoon, early in the slide. It seemed like this morning. Um, um, that's what he looks like almost every day. And uh, we go out, we talk of the birds, and uh, and what's wonderful is that we don't always step on each other's toes and say, "Oh, look at that!" You know, look at that. We do look, and then. Um, I mean, we, we walked up to that, that beautiful spruce grouse. He took his pictures, I took mine, and uh, different, and we talked about it after we saw it. What we knew about spruce grouse, he knows a lot more than I do. But anyway, it was fun, and he's a great guy to go out with, and people are looking forward to go out with him. He has a lot of people who says, can I go out to Moose Bog with you? That's the thing he wants to hear, or victory, okay? Well, thank you very I, much as a relative uh, new as you. a relative newcomer to Vermont with very limited ability to get about. I have made it absolutely. I have to get up to the Northeast Kingdom. I'm there you go. Yes, you do. Beautiful. Yes, you do. It, the thank jumping you. off the jumping off point for the rest of the North Kingdom is St. Johnsbury. So if you get to St. John, Johnsbury and grab a lunch, head north from there because it's about fifty miles to the to the Canadian border. And the, between St. Johnsbury and the border, it's the kingdom, Northeast Kingdom. Yep, I hope you do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlie. Yeah. Have fun, y'all. And uh, Thank you. and uh, I'll I'll hope to, I'll probably drag Corey up here one of these one of these years to do a program for us. How about that? Definitely. <laughs> okay. Um, we we will email out all the resources that Charlie discussed uh, to everybody yep. who registered for this program this evening. Okay, great. great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Good Mike. luck. Thanks, Thank you. Charlie. You're welcome. It's fun talking with you. Have a good night. Check it out.